It's always a little challenging to be speaking about research, particularly right after lunch. But I hope that um, the panelists who are, have joined me and some of you out in the audience um, upon whom I will call um, will really be able to talk about how this relates to the challenges that we're facing uh, in the field and how this will change what we're trying to do. Um, as I was thinking about it, what we're asking technologies to do, largely, is to help us bridge the gap between what is control today to elimination. Whether we're replacing drugs and drug strategies, or we're replacing diagnostics with somewhat different tools that will accomplish different goals, or potentially introducing entirely new constructs like a malaria vaccine. Now, um, this concept of, of bridging that gap is really important because over the day, and, and in particularly last night, we had almost two conversations going. One was a control conversation, what we're doing today to control <clears throat> malaria. And then the other one was an elimination conversation in which we're talking about the infectious reservoir and different strategies that are gonna to have to be taken. Ultimately, these will need to be combined. It will need to be one strategy. Um, but we're not quite there yet. And so the job of this panel is to really address what innovation can bring. And I really want to emphasize that for whether it's polio or smallpox, even Rinderpest had moments where innovation solved some of the problems that they were facing. And I think that is actually accentuated when it comes to malaria. So uh, let me ask Chris Plow to start off. Um, I was fortunate to engage with him as he was leading some of the work on malaria on drug strategies, so uh, I knew who to call. <laughs> well, thanks, Gina. Um, so I'll try to set the stage a little bit uh, for a uh, conversation about drugs and also some of the other technologies and, and tools in the pipeline, but I, I first want to go back to uh, the, the notion of, uh, that Gina just brought up about control versus elimination, what we're talking about doing here. So when I was a medical student working in Kenya in 1986, uh, uh, loosely supervised by somebody sitting here who was in the military at the time, uh, we went out and did a survey uh, just pricking the fingers of adult men in, in western Kenya in a village called Saraditi and uh, checking under the microscope uh, who was infected. Uh, we surveyed 100 men, none of them had symptoms of malaria, and 90% were walking around with plasmodium falciparum parasites in their blood. So we've known this is the case for a long time in Africa, where there's a lot of malaria, people build up immunity, uh, people uh, can tolerate parasites uh, after enough years of exposure without being sick. So we talk about the asymptomatic reservoir. What's a surprise to us is that we always thought that in lower transmission settings, Asia, uh, Latin America, this would be very rare. Anybody who is experiencing infection should get sick because they don't have immunity. But with some very sensitive diagnostic tools, molecular diagnosis, uh, we're learning now that uh, perhaps as much as 40% or more of people on the Thai-Myanmar border, for example, might be walking around with asymptomatic parasites. And this really changes the dynamic of surveillance, drugs, and ultimately even vaccines, what we want these, these tools to do. So with, with that as background, um, uh, I will say that uh, the, the diagnostic tests that are, are being used to, to show these kinds of shockingly high levels of infection in Asia are not something that we can roll out, not something that community health workers can collect the samples and, and do. It involves drawing a couple of mils of venous blood. You actually have to centrifuge the sample out in the field, uh, do some other fancy things, and plunk it in, in liquid nitrogen. That's not scalable. So a lot of what we're trying to do is take technologies that are very promising, uh, tests that can do exciting new things, and really get them to a stage where they're robust enough to work in the field in, in scalable conditions. And, and Paul uh, Labari will talk uh, more about some of these technologies in, in just a minute. If we're trying to use drugs, uh, uh, one of our earlier speakers mentioned uh, targeted mass treatment. That where it's basically using drugs to eliminate all the parasites in the human population. And by the way, the reason I put the eyes of the hippo up there is as opposed to the tip of the iceberg is to give you the sense of this very large amount, this very large reservoir that you can't see. The eyes of the hippo represent the clinical malaria. Uh, it's just a more tropically uh, appropriate uh, uh, analogy. 
I'm glad you told us what that yeah. was because <laughs> it's not inherently obvious. We're looking at there. Yeah, that, those are the eyes of the hippo. That's the malaria you can see, the clinical disease, and what we have to tackle if we want to eradicate malaria is everything that's under the surface of the water. Um, so if, if we're going to be using drugs to treat people who don't have symptoms, and that's what we're talking about now, that's being uh, piloted uh, along the Thailand-Myanmar border and, and soon in, in other parts of Myanmar as well as Vietnam, I think, uh, and, uh, and Bangladesh and, and elsewhere in the world, these drugs have to be uh, extremely safe because you're treating people who aren't sick. Uh, they need to be effective uh, in Southeast Asia against artemisinin-resistant parasites. And ideally, they should be administered in a single dose. So they're, they're something that you can give in a campaign and not to have to have people coming back. When people aren't sick, they're not as motivated. Uh, so there's been progress uh, with some uh, promising new drugs that are in early stages of clinical testing. A lot of this work is uh, uh, supported through the Medicines for Malaria Venture, uh, notably with uh, uh, some partners in the pharmaceutical industry, Novartis and uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, come to mind. None of these candidates yet are ideal. Uh, Tofenic, one of the very long-acting drug the U.S. military has also been involved with, uh, is uh, something that requires uh, some uh, testing before it's, it's safe to use. Others have multiple doses, so we really are years away from, from having a drug that's uh, going to be widely available for elimination indications. Um, vaccines, again, we're not, we're not talking just about the clinical disease, the eyes of the hippo. We, there is a vaccine that I'm sure Ashley will talk about, RTSS, that's moving toward licensure that uh, has efficacy against clinical malaria. We don't know what that vaccine will do to the risk of transmission. Uh, and so uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, next generation vaccines building on the success of RTSS uh, from Ashley. Um, there's been some, uh, some really interesting results recently from a very different approach with vaccines, taking the whole organism uh, that's been irradiated in the mosquito, something that was tried at University of Maryland 40 years ago. If you give 1,000 infected bites from irradiated mosquitoes, basically using the mosquito as a needle and a syringe to, to immunize with an attenuated whole organism vaccine, eventually you can get protection. So uh, we've been involved in some tests with uh, Scenario, Steve Hoffman is here, uh, and recently in a, a study done at NIH, much of the support for this, by the way, has come from NIH, uh, in a very small study, 100% protection was achieved against experimental challenge. So this is now moving into the field. There are many obstacles to getting this uh, ready to go for uh, elimination, but something that, that completely abrogates infection, uh, that prevents not just the clinical disease above the surface, but uh, uh, the infection below the surface uh, is what we're going to need for elimination. So. Uh, that's the kind of uh, approach that will be needed. Um, there are, are, are more kind of high-tech approaches, uh, just from a finger stick of blood, the same way you get blood for a rapid diagnostic test or, uh, or for microscopy. You can actually now uh, get genetic information from the whole genome of malaria parasites, and there are ways of then analyzing that information to try and, and predict the parasite migration patterns. Uh, where parasites are genetically communicating with other populations and potentially highlighting areas of, of risk. Uh, when I talk about this kind of work, I'm challenged by people from the Gates Foundation, for example. Is this information that the NMCP directors are clamoring for right now, that, that the people in the field need? And uh, so I think the onus is on researchers to show how this kind of information can be actually uh, made useful to make decisions right now on, on what's needed for uh, controlling and eliminating malaria. Um, but, whoops, uh-oh. But I, I want to come back to something that we've been talking about uh, intermittently throughout the day, and that's the political will. I think even with some of these uh, higher tech approaches, uh, you know, high throughput molecular surveillance to, to map uh, uh, infection or, or drug resistance, uh, we shouldn't underestimate the political will benefits of a pretty modest investment in capacity development in the malaria endemic countries. Uh, we're looking here at some uh, pictures from training workshops, uh, both in the lab and in the field with surveillance uh, in Myanmar. And uh, there, there's just a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, ownership and buy-in you can get from working with the local partners to analyze samples in the country, not ship, the, not ship them out, and to establish the capacity for surveillance. And I think ultimately for this to work in the long term, as we've heard in the finance uh, discussion, the countries are going to have to invest. And if this is seen as something that uh, you know, the uh, development partners are doing and, and kind of uh, 
you know, owning, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine how we're going to get the kind of local buy-in that we need for the long-term success. So I, I really want to emphasize that. And, and I will just say, apropos of the last discussion, on the upper right there, uh, you're, you're looking at a, uh, somebody who was once uh, living and working on the border attempting to overthrow the Burmese military, standing next to a brigadier general uh, who is a, a, a malariologist and, and one of our partners now on, on uh, malaria control and elimination. So I think if, if, we, if uh, this can work at an individual level, I, I would hope it could work at a military to military level uh, between the US uh, and, uh, and Myanmar. And my last slide, just to kind of finish up, then kind of takes a step back uh, to highlight the importance of uh, cross-border collaboration and cross-sectorial cooperation. Uh, on the bottom left is a, a border post between China and Myanmar. On the, on the upper area there is a refugee camp on the China-Myanmar border. Uh, and then on the bottom right, there's a river crossing. And uh, a kilometer away from the official border crossing, you have people coming back and forth from the jade market in China into Myanmar. And this just, again, highlights the importance of having tools that can be used uh, in these kind of settings in refugee camps uh, and uh, in areas where there's not much infrastructure. And on the bottom right, the building on the far right there is actually the, the Ministry of Health of the Kachin Independence Organization. So this is an area of Myanmar uh, that the, the, neither the military nor the civilian government has access to, but working with the Chinese CDC, you, you, can, uh, you can work on this in this part of the world. Um, and we're, we're beginning to do uh, uh, surveillance here. Um, so as we, as we talk about these tools, I think we always have to bring it back to what's, what's really going to be scalable uh, out there in, in the places, in the, in the border areas uh, where, where we need to, uh, to be working. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Would you pass it down to yeah. Ashley? Thank you. <clears throat> so we've seen um, a huge uh, shift in the in the focus of uh, malaria vaccine development over the over the last uh, few years, uh, back when resources started to flow into translational uh, R and D for malaria vaccines around you know 2000, the focus was really on developing vaccines that could minimise the the disease and death in the highest burden population, so young African children um, exposed to falciparum malaria, and uh, there's been a as we've discussed today, you know, a big shift towards um, not just focused on the, the, that population, but more broadly the role that vaccines could potentially have in elimination and eradication of malaria. Uh, a lot of the gains that we've seen over the last 15 years have been done in the absence of a vaccine, and so I don't, we shouldn't take for granted that a vaccine is absolutely essential. And I think the next um, slide I, I find is a really you know, great example of what a vaccine could have done to leverage some of the gains that have been made by other interventions over the years. So this is a, a very nice review article that looks at uh, 75 different resurgence events in 61 countries um, from the 1930s um, to the 2000s. And the main take home message for, from this article is that almost all of these events, over 90% of them, were attributed in part to weakening of, of control programs. So you can see pretty much across the board here, and there's more examples in the paper, but if you look across the top three, uh, these are all parasite prevalence data uh, the others are on malaria cases. But if you look ac across the top there, the, 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 the impact of, of various um, other interventions to get transmission down to very low levels has been proven over and over again. But as soon as you pull back, then the parasite comes back with a vengeance, and, and within a few years, you're back where you started. So we really do look at this data in the context of the role that a vaccine could have had to harness those gains and leave those individuals when you were maybe forced to move out of those populations, political will died, resources were limited, that you could have left those individuals with an immunity that they would have carried with them uh, independent of, the, of their behavior um, uh, during the days and the intervening months and years. So I think this is a really good um, example of how we see uh, vaccines for elimination really leveraging what can be done with other tools to get transmission down to very low levels and then have vaccines really do the job in terms of preventing reintroduction and, and reinfections. So um, I think our timing was, was probably as bad as it could have been in, in terms of the first um, malaria vaccine technology roadmap, which was a, um, a, an effort that involved hundreds of people around the world to define what are the real goals for malaria vaccine development. And uh, this, this was published back in 2006 with a lot of involvement from WHO, many of you in this room, to really define what, what are our goals, what are we trying to achieve 
from malaria vaccines. And the, the strategic goal was a highly efficacious vaccine against Plasmodium falciparum malaria that could be implemented in, in young African children by 2025. And then a landmark goal of 2015 to develop a partially efficacious vaccine, 50% efficacy uh, against severe disease and death. And that's what we were working um, for, I think, it's sort of from 2000 on. This was really the main focus. This was solidified in this roadmap in 2006. And then, of course, in 2007, uh, the, the field began to shift as the, the call for a renewed focus on elimination and eradication um, came. So over the last few years, we've been working very closely with WHO, all of the other funding agencies, the Gates Foundation, USAID, um, uh, EU, and others, to define a new set of priority goals that are really aligned with where the field is today in terms of not just thinking about vaccines to minimize uh, disease and death, but, but uh, more long-term, the role vaccines might have in elimination and eradication. So the original landmark from 2006 still stands, and, and RTSS, a GSK um, vaccine that we've been very heavily uh, de uh, involved in developing at, at PATH Malaria Vaccine Initiative, um, has the potential uh, to achieve the landmark goal um, if it is, um, uh, uh, receives a positive um, uh, recommendation as early as next year. So that landmark is still in play, but, but now the, the goals going forward are really focused around um, uh, two endpoints. One, a vaccine with high level of protective efficacy against clinical malaria. This is both falciparum and vivax malaria. And then goal two is really the, the new one, which focuses on vaccines that reduce transmission uh, of the parasite that are going to be particularly important um, for, uh, for supporting future uh, elimination eradication efforts. In alignment with this, this roadmap, the WHO has led a process to define what are called preferred product characteristics to give further, further guidance to vaccine developments on what the, the key parameters are um, for vaccines that could be um, favorably, favorably reviewed for pre-qualification, things like the number of doses, how those doses are administered, the um, thermostability of the vaccine, and what have you. And those preferred product characteristics should be available um, over, the, over the coming months and will be important uh, in guiding uh, future decisions and investments in, in, uh, in malaria vaccine development. So in terms of uh, that, so we've got long-term goals with the roadmap, which, uh, which is really important for us to have. Uh, in terms of the short-term goals, uh, in, the, in the next few years, obviously the 2015 landmark goal uh, with RTSS, we're all, we're all watching that. Uh, the preferred product characteristics that I mentioned to guide the development of vaccines that are going to meet uh, those new uh, technology roadmap goals. And then the regulatory approval process for transmission blocking vaccines is, is a challenge. Uh, we've made a lot of progress over the last few years. Uh, working with FDA, uh, including some discussions in the last few months, to, to define what the pathway would be to license a vaccine that doesn't provide a direct immediate benefit to vaccine recipients, but provides a community effect through high coverage and, and high efficacy. And, and we may get a chance to talk about that a little bit more when we talk about some of the key uh, challenges. I think in the midterm, hopefully we're going to do this before 2020, um, maybe in the next couple of years, evidence that the high level of efficacy that's needed um, to support uh, elimination agenda uh, could be achieved um, hopefully before 2020, including with platforms that are really you know, fit for purpose for, for implementation um, uh, in endemic settings. Um, just to finish, this is um, the global malaria vaccine um, pipeline. We're starting to see some new transmission blocking um, vaccine candidates coming on. Those are shown in, in yellow here. These were not on the, road, on the uh, pipeline a few years ago. These are vaccines designed to induce immunity that can block human to mosquito transmission, the herd immunity effects I mentioned. Um, very heavily uh, represented are pruritic vaccines, as you might expect. Uh, can prevent uh, infections as well as provide a direct and immediate benefit. So the best of all cases, really. These are all shown uh, in pink. And then in blue, you have the blood stage vaccines, which are really primarily focused on the individual benefit from um, prevention of clinical disease. And we've definitely seen a, um, somewhat of a waning in the, in the pipeline for blood stage vaccines as there's been a, a resurgence in the focus on elimination and eradication. I think a point I wanted to make on this is, is really the importance of a portfolio-based approach to achieving these um, malaria vaccine development goals. Uh, until you get through um, you know, phase 2B data, we really do advocate strongly that investments are made in the context of a, a portfolio that enables trade-offs to be made as new data emerges and that we don't commit ourselves 
too early to a single uh, vaccine approach, and certainly until it's, it's reached um, proof of concept in the field. And then, of course, it makes perfect sense to, to advocate for a, um, a product-specific investment in alignment with a, um, a specific target product profile, as we've seen with, with the RTSS vaccine. So with that, um, hopefully that's a helpful Great. introduction Great. Thanks for setting that stage, vaccines. Ashley. Sorry? Thanks for setting that oh, stage. Yeah, Great. Now, Paul? Thank you. The world of diagnostics. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, uh, Katie, and the rest of the CSIS team for uh, setting this up and, and inviting me to be on the, uh, the, the panel here. I think many of you guys were thinking that you might make it through an afternoon of elimination discussions without seeing a single iceberg. Um, <laughs> but uh, scrolling through a few more slides here, we'll get to it. There we go. There it is. The iceberg. <laughs> Um, and very similar to the eyes of the hippo, I think the iceberg is a great um, uh, way to describe what Ellen referred to as uh, defense above the water. Um, very successful uh, efforts over the last couple of decades um, attacking the, the clinical side. Um, but the, uh, the offense needed for the asymptomatic reservoir is really going to uh, require new tools and a transition or a bridging period, as, as Gene has been referring to. Um, Good question. Last night we talked about the advances in technologies and, and the ridiculous uh, amount of new tools that are available. And, and perhaps it's, it's easy to have one lulled into the thinking that maybe we don't need new tools in the, in the area of diagnostics. Um, I think this is a, a good example um, that Lisa White's been using to describe how inadequate um, current RDTs actually are in detecting the asymptomatic reservoir. So what you have here is a cohort of PCR positive uh, malaria uh, specimens that's, you know, they've detected the DNA uh, to prove that each of these specimens can in fact transmit the disease. And yet the RDTs in the bag represent all of the negative tests from that cohort. And there's only uh, two positive tests in that cohort. Now, uh, I'm not quite clear on, on whether this is representative of, of all RDTs. I suspect this had to do with the specific commercially available RDT chosen. But I think in, in general, the, the statistics I've seen is that up to 90% of the asymptomatic uh, DNA positive tests out there are in fact are, uh, RDT negative. Um, and so I, I would argue that in fact we really do need some advances in the world of diagnostics in order to see that lower part of the, uh, the asymptomatic reservoir, the lower part of the, the reservoir underwater. The question is how, how would we use them? If I could advance. There we go. How do we use those tests? Well, if you look at the upper part of this, this graphic, this is a framework the diameter team created to help work through the, the discussion of how diagnostics are used. And uh, the symptomatics or the clinical cases are covered really in the control phase uh, through passive case detection. People are walking into a clinic. Um, and that's relatively uh, not so complex as compared to all of the different use scenarios for how diagnostics get used in the elimination context when you're seeking that asymptomatic population. Uh, we call those active infection detection because you have to af actively go out and find these people. Uh, it gets more complex. We talk about reactive where you're reacting to an index case or proactive where you might be going um, into uh, an area of unknown malaria and trying to find out uh, whether that's a hot spot or not. It gets even more detailed than that. I won't go into to the details, but it is a much more complex set of use scenarios. Um, and, and sometimes the actual performance characteristics for one use scenario might be in contrast uh, to the uses uh, or the performance requirements for another use scenario. So uh, building good target product profiles is really key to product development in this area and getting the users of those tests involved. At the bottom we have laboratory testing um, and uh, as you go for the asymptomatic cases, the, the actual parasitic density goes down. So whereas historically microscopy has, an, has been an excellent gold standard uh, in the control phase, it is in fact uh, a static measure of a dynamic infection. And in fact, we really do need uh, reference tests, laboratory tests that are capable of 10 times to 100 times or even better uh, limit of detection than currently available with microscopy. So how are we doing in that pipeline? Well, it's not a very rich pipeline compared to vaccines, and I think we've got a lot more work to do. This is a pipeline, uh, it's an abbreviated pipeline, 
representative of some of the leading technologies that are under development and, and working through towards uh, commercialization. Um, and it's a lot more rich than it was, say, five years ago. A lot of uh, good money has gone into to r and Working through this, you can see it, there's really three categories. We really need, do need true positive point of care tests. So you can go out and conduct that active infection detection uh, with a test and treat people on the spot. You don't want loss to follow up. You don't want a three-day gap. So the positive uh, test at the point of care is really important. Uh, the IDT initiative led by the Gates Foundation, uh, the diameter team at PATH is the, the managing partner of this initiative, is advancing an HRP2 or an antigen specific uh, infection detection test using the form factor of RDTs. Why? Because this is an accepted form factor. It's got an ease of use that's hard to beat. Uh, we want to get more of these out there. We want them more sensitive uh, so that we can support the active infection detection. Isothermal methods have come a long way. Uh, are they really point of care tests? Well, there's, there's a lot of gray area there. You've seen some commercialized lamp tests and also a lot of uh, more uh, research going into isothermal, looking at Vivax, uh, higher throughput tests, other isothermal methods listed there, uh, helicase dependent cross priming amplification. And I think really exciting, although it may be a few years out, is the idea of being able to have a non instrumented or an electricity free disposable version of molecular. And there are some efforts in the, the product development pipeline focusing on, on that. So there you would have the ease of use of an RDT. You throw it away after you're done, uh, but you have the accuracy of a laboratory-based test. For a true positive lab test, as I said, you really do need very, very um, sensitive reference methods. Uh, and in the pipeline are uh, PCR for both DNA, uh, which is a high volume, high blood volume test, as well as PCR for RNA, uh, which uh, allows a, a much smaller, uh, even a, a finger stick uh, volume of blood. If you're going to have an HRP2 infection detection test, well, you really do need reference standards that are even more sensitive in the laboratory. And so that's why we have the uh, HRP2 QELISA uh, reference method there. And then finally, uh, there's a saying in, in, in quality control and manufacturing uh, that you, you can't uh, quality inspect something that you can't measure. And if our goal is eradication and the elimination of parasites from the human reservoir, then you actually do need a tool to measure that. And so you absolutely need a true negative laboratory test where you can go out, take specimens, and uh, demonstrate that a population in general is, uh, is negative and, and that transmission hasn't occurred for a number of years. And serology is an excellent measure of that if you start looking at age-specific cohorts. So with that, my last slide here. Oops, we're cycling through. I don't know what happened. Give me a second. Just a few take-home points. There's really no s silver bullet. Hopefully one of my slides um, indicated that there are many use scenarios and, and probably no one tool is going to fit uh, all the needs in the way that RDTs have been really instrumental in, in, in a one-size-fits-all for control um, recently. New tools can create temporal and cost efficiencies for malaria, uh, that should say malaria elimination programs. Um, unfortunately, though, market forces are insufficient to drive innovation, and we've seen this with RDTs, we've in fact seen the opposite, where the market forces have been a force against innovation. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it may be the case that the, uh, the scale of the markets or, or the economies of scale that we're used to seeing with RDTs uh, may not apply in an elimination context, depending on how many uh, countries are adopting the same tactics and therefore the same tools. So it's something I think we want to do some market shaping to make sure that we can try to achieve the same economies of scale. User friendliness, uh, you can't underestimate that. And I think going with platforms that are familiar uh, can get you uh, an operational sensitivity uh, much better than uh, platforms that are, are difficult to use. And, uh, and then finally, there's a lot of innovation pileup. Uh, right now, a lot of that has to do with unknowns. Uh, we still don't know everything about the heterogeneity of, of malaria and the differences between how tactics and tools may use may be used and successful in one area and not another. Uh, and so I think we still have to do some basic research um, and, uh, and also move that up to uh, the level of new policy and, and consensus, consensus at that level in order to uh, drive innovation. Great, thank you. Now, do we have a microphone?
great. If you could hand it to Dr. Steve Hoffman up here. He's in the middle right in front of me. <laughs> and the question for you, Steve, is um, first of all, in terms of acceptability, you are working with a novel, classic approach which requires IV formulation. I'd love to hear what kind of response you've had from people in country because, where you're doing studies about the acceptability of that kind of a strategy, which is very different from any other vaccine. And then could you comment on what engaging like with research community in Africa and Asia, wherever you're doing your studies has been like, because you're taking a very different approach to working uh, in product development. Well, how long do you want me to talk for it? You get, you get a minute. <laughs> <laughs> now, so let me just go back about uh, to 2009 when there was a meeting convened by the WHO in uh, Senegal about whole, whole parasite malaria vaccines. And there were a number of individuals from institutions uh, that you may have been associated with before and others who stood up and said, it is impossible, we will never accept a vaccine that um, is IV, for example, right. uh, what we call now direct venous inoculation. And the next morning, seven African scientists from seven different countries stood up and said, you give us a vaccine that works, we'll figure out how to administer it. Um, as you well know, we've been studying our vaccine, which is uh, given through a 25 gauge needle of 0.5 mLs in Mali, in, uh, in Tanzania and Equatorial Guinea, and uh, though, so far, we haven't gone to children, but we will soon be in infants. Uh, in Mali, they've given 500 consecutive injections in less than 10 seconds without a miss, and 60% of the injectees don't even know that they've been injected. So I think the answer is, and, and I, I would like to extend that, you know, uh, you mentioned about the target product, product profile and so on. The target product profile has to start with being sensitive enough. A vaccine has to start with being effective in us. And the idea that uh, in the 21st century, you know, our, we, we have a job of getting a highly effective malaria vaccine or a non-PCR, uh, highly sensitive um, diagnostic or a drug that works, you know, in a single dose for, you know, uh, for all parasites. And my view, and, and as you well know, and its scenario has been, let's get that first. The idea that we can't figure out how to engineer getting that to people, um, I, I think is just, you know, to try to start with practical and then move towards effective when you don't have effective is not, is not the way that we've chosen to go. So the answer is that our colleagues in Africa who are clamoring for this have never once said we can't do it. They just said, let's see if it works, and if it works, we'll figure out how to do it. Great, thank you, Nat. Lift your hand. No, 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 lift your hand. Michael, could you take the microphone, please? <laughs> so you will notice track? we've had people talking about <laughs> drugs and diagnostics, vaccine strategies, and um, wait, wait, you got up, you got up. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry, the back of my head is kind of rude. It's okay, all right. So. Um, and what, because we couldn't keep on inviting more people, we can't hit absolutely everything happen. It's a very rich field right now. But there's a very important area that's not on the table, which is vector control. And I didn't want to talk about insecticides because clearly there's been insecticides being worked on to, to replace or um, offer alternatives for insecticide resistance. But if you could address a little bit of the novel paradigms like spatial <clears throat> repellents, et cetera, just let the group know the richness of what's coming along. Uh, okay, thank you, Regina. And I have to apologize. In the last session, it was a shameless attempt to get the names of the mosquitoes on the record here. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, we do have Fred and Martin will be talking in the next session about entomology. But I think it, it's often forgotten that there is a lot of innovation going on in the vector, in the vector control field. So uh, right now I'm doing some work with the Innovative Vector Control Consortium. There is work with insecticides, as you said. Just to make one point, though, although vector control is more than 60% of GMAP, of our investment in malaria, when you look at the global insecticide industry, the pesticide industry for agriculture is about 54 billion per year. For vector control, it's less than a billion. So we have the same issues with MMV, MVI, of it's the public-private partnerships to develop these new products. So there is a lot of work going on uh, with new formulations, new insecticides, et cetera. But for innovative prod products, 
Uh, there is work going on, and a lot of this was started, again, from the AFPMB, the Armed Forces Pest Management Board, in their deployed warfighter protection program. But looking at uh, treated materials, repellents, uh, spatial repellents, and we have a number of projects now with IVCC looking at push-pull strategies where you have a spatial repellent combined with a trap to push the mosquito into a trap. There's other work going on with um, attractive toxic sugar baits, trying to get the mosquito, interrupting the, the mosquito's life when she is looking for a carbohydrate meal. Um, some other things with swarming, et cetera. So there, there are a number of little niche issues going on, but I think what's important to stress is that we will never have a magic bullet, as Paul put up here. We will never have a magic bullet like we had with DDT, like we had with pyrethroids. Everything now, I think, moving forward, will be much more niche products. Things that you can use, not globally, but in certain situations, spatial repellents, say, for funerals in Africa, or um, uh, topical repellents or treated clothing for rubber tappers in Burma. So much more niche products. And this requires people. And I'm glad that the very first session with Alan and, and, um, and Bernard mentioned the issues of systems and capacity building, because without the environmental health technician, environmental health officer, the public health entomologist, we don't have the capacity to adapt these new tools that are coming to a specific situation. So we often joke about the, the gray hairs and the no hairs in our business. And fortunately, I, I think there are a lot of young, good young <laughs> entomologists coming up for the next generation of public health entomologists that can really develop these innovative vector control tools, thinking that we will not have something of the magic bullet that we had for our generation and previous generations. Thank you very much. So um, to bring it back to the panel, um, clearly there are a series of innovations and probably more than we can swallow, right? There's a pipeline so that we can optimize and choose the best of what will work well and what will be acceptable and what will be usable. Um, has industry remained engaged? And let me just uh, ask you to opine that, because we've gone from a control scenario to an elimination scenario, and there's unknowns about what the scale of manufacturing is required and who's gonna pay for it, because you're not dealing with treatment of acute illness for which people are willing to pay. These are different public health strategies. Has industry remained enthusiastic and engaged? And let me start, well, let's start with diagnostics. Sure, thanks, Gina. Has industry remained engaged? Is oh, that, are they? That, are they engaged? Well, well I think uh, that's actually two, two different questions. So mm -hmm. the first question, um, as I said, there's been disincentives to innovation, driving down the price of RDTs, rapid diagnostic tests over the years have certainly provided an in, uh, a disincentive. Um, and I think, so that, that's where uh, some of these uh, in-between players like PATH or the, with Gates Foundation funding can create that incentive through product development partnerships to, to recreate that. So in fact, getting them back engaged is part of our product development plan. And, and in fact, uh, although I can't disclose who we're working with right now, we certainly are working with some of the same players who have the broad distribution reach uh, and a history of um, high quality and have the R&D capabilities to move forward with, with new tools. Ashley, you know, RTSS, will, it'll, whatever will happen will happen. What about the pipeline following? Are those academic constructs or is industry engaged? Yeah, I think when we think of industry, I really group it into two because I think they're so different. I think pharma and biotech, you know, are, are very different industrial partners that we work with. So I think our experience with pharma, obviously with, with GSK, has been there's been a, a commitment to malaria vaccine development all the way up through uh, the senior management, which I think is critical. Uh, we haven't seen that with other large pharma, so we've tried to engage uh, Novartis and Merck and Sanofi. And you get tremendous enthusiasm with the scientists, and you'll get so far, but when push comes to shove, there, there isn't the commitment there to put the resources onto these projects. So I think you need the commitment all the way up to the top if you're working with large pharma. With biotech, it's very different. I think um, there's a lot of enthusiasm in biotech in sort of uh, proving their technology. And uh, because we have these fantastic challenge models, we have a very, um, um, 
exciting space for them to work in in terms of um, proving that their technology can do something in such, you know, preventing infection in challenge models and what have you. However, working with biotech, you know, you've got you know, groups with new technologies don't always have the most experience in, in manufacturing their product, and that can lead to some delays and, and challenges. So we see industry as critical, particularly for platforms, um, but it's a, it's a very different um, space. You know, um, biotech is, is extremely enthusiastic. Farmers are concerned about success because success, success comes with a huge obligation, and sure. uh, they understand that, and they have to manage it. So I think they're very different, but for us, clearly, you know, um, um, these commercial partners are, are, are critical to what we do. And of course, then we also rely on the academics to, to bring through uh, novel target antigens, key assays and model systems and things to support that. And I think that's where the, the PDP model works so well because you have to really bring all of that together. You've got to br bring together a GSK doing assays at Hopkins with some new antigens coming through somewhere else and bring all that together. And that won't happen. I don't think that will happen organically without somebody driving it. And, and that's really what we see as one of our roles. Chris, I know you don't work for MMV, but you're aware of their <laughs> portfolio, specifically for the CERCAP, single dose uh, radical cure type drugs. Is industry engaged? Well, I think, yeah, for, the, for that drug in particular and, and more broadly for drugs, industry is engaged, but you asked two questions. Are they engaged and are they enthusiastic? Okay. And so, you know, industry is engaged to some extent and there is some enthusiasm, in my experience, uh, sometimes that's a personal thing where the family member of a CEO spent time in Africa and got interested mm -hmm. in malaria. That's how Pfizer kind of got into looking at chloroquine azithromycin. Uh, where you see the enthusiasm tempered though is I think there's a, a, a much lower risk uh, tolerance for risk for something that's not going to be a big blockbuster for you know, cholesterol lowering or erectile sure. dysfunction or whatever when it's something like malaria. So anything that can be done to mitigate risk, whether it's you know, liability for vaccines or whether it's, uh, you know, kind of uh, looking at markets up front for vaccines or, or drugs uh, is, is going to help um, because I think, I think the level of enthusiasm is just marginal for, for these products and it, would, it doesn't take very much for the, the pharma uh, companies to pull back. So uh, like the Gates Foundation has done for, and others for vaccines, uh, the more, and even I'm sure this is true for diagnostics, the more we can kind of get out ahead of anticipating you know, who's going to pay for it, what are going to be the, the, the risks to the manufacturer, and, and how can we kind of increase their comfort uh, will be important to do. So the question then becomes, um, because at some point, I mean, um, academia generates innovation, innovative ideas, product development partnerships creates a group of people who can do different components uh, and have historically d done so. But eventually, some kind of company needs to manufacture product X um, and so that it is, it is usable. Um, and the question is, in 2014, basically almost 2015, what should we think, be thinking about doing to make this whole enterprise more successful? Let me just open it up to you first, and then we'll see what other ideas people in the room have. Let me remove money from it. Yes, we need more money. Let's, let's just take that as a given. We used to speak of pilot lot manufacturing for vaccines being a huge barrier. I think there's lots of providers of that kind of capacity. In fact, they're competing with each other in a cutthroat manner, so it's not access to that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. We used to have problems with protein manufacturing, well, you know, and, and the appropriate folding. That's not a problem. We used to have problems with quality control of the diagnostics and more systematic approach was taken to make sure that the ones that were out there are good quality. Um, we didn't have a pipeline for drugs, and now there definitely is one. You didn't show the picture, but it's, there's definitely one. What would make our respective jobs easier in terms of bringing innovation forward? So I'll, take a, a first, <laughs> I'll take a first stab at this. Um, you know, I think we need to think of it not as just uh, research and development moving to commercial, research moving to development, moving to, to commercialization mm -hmm. with perhaps a, a tech transfer from an academic to, uh, you know, somebody who has market share. I think we have to think of the overall architecture of the vision of what's needed um, and engage all of the parties, including the policymakers and the regulators early on in the conversation, engage them as members of that, that if not advisors to members of that product development partnership because I think what, what can very often happen 
is that you get to the point where the technology's uh, there, you've validated it to your specifications, and then you find out that that's the stopping point, that there isn't this receptive, energetic um, population you know, market ready to receive it. So I think especially in, in the case of, of new tools aimed at tactics that are in flux and still being developed and validated, I think we need to engage everyone and make sure that they, they move forward in lockstep together. So it sounds like the, kind of what you're saying is we need to think harder and be smarter about what we're asking for and mean it. Because if we keep asking for a variety of things and then end up not using them, we won't have too many times at bat right. that industry will say, yeah, no, we don't really believe you. And that's where we used to be 15 years ago. So I kind of worry about, because I see all this wealth of innovation, different kinds of constructs. From a field operational view, that's a little overwhelming, I would think. Uh, are there any people here that are worried about how you're going to take on all this innovation, who's going to pay for it, train for it, and is it worth it, how, how you make that decision? Or are you all fine with it? <laughs> Someone, yes, Steve. So I'm, I'm actually not clear on what you're saying. So if we start with diagnostics and say, we just heard we need a highly sensitive, easily executed diagnostic. We don't have it, okay? I mean, so we're not asking- For, for asymptomatics. It means highly, you know, you have to recognize yeah. parasitemia at a level below, you know, the most sensitive thick blood smear, which is about four, two, two or four parasites per microliter, but practically 50 parasites per microliter. So you need to have that. We have test PCR that we can do that with right now, it's but not it's not terrible. practical. So the question then becomes, are, you know, we heard about a program, are we engaging all the people that we could in such a program, you know, are, do we have all the technical experts working on it that they could be? And then you raise the question is, what, is it worth it for them to do it, all right? So what's the incentive? Well, the incentive really is only gonna be that, you know, UNICEF, the Gates Foundation, the world community is gonna buy this stuff because there's nobody out there gonna pay for it otherwise. So you have two types of- But it could also be clarity of what, of what the strategy is. And I think that's what these documents, GMAP and GTS, where, where if we're clear that the strategy is elimination, and that's what we're moving to, that there's tools that are missing that will solve problems that people aren't grappling with yet. That's a huge transition we need to make that we haven't made yet. And that's kind of the point I was trying to get to. Okay, I mean, so I, th I think that that's important, you know, and it's the same yeah. thing whether it's for vaccines or drugs. Absolutely. What do you need it for? You yeah. know, we need a dr vaccine that's 100% protective for life in one dose, okay, that you give under your tongue, right? I mean, right. but it's not gonna happen, in, you know, in my lifetime. Exactly, the person with the red tie behind you. Please identify Hi. yourself. I'm Roman Macaya, the ambassador of Costa Rica. Uh, I find this uh, topic fascinating. Uh, you've been talking about le level of enthusiasm for developing this type of technology. And if the enthusiasm isn't there, then you need a proxy for enthusiasm. Um, how can you achieve that? There's been discussion on, uh, for example, patent extensions that, in other words, if you developed a, a drug or a patent, a uh, vaccine that fits certain criteria, you would get sort of a coupon to extend a patent of your choice. So it wouldn't necessarily be, you wouldn't necessarily be making your money on the malaria vaccine, you'd be making your money on extending your patent on a very lucrative drug. And, uh, you know, however this is paid for, there has to be a transfer of uh, investment or wealth from the rich to the poor, because, you know, the, the, the base of patients is not going to be able to pay for this. So the, the, getting the incentive right is critical. I mean. We've seen it with orphan drugs, where drugs weren't developed for rare diseases. Well, malaria um, isn't a rare disease, but in the orphan drug uh, situation, it giving a monopoly, uh, a temporary monopoly on the treatment of the disease uh, created the incentive. So what is the incentive for malaria? I mean, there has to be something that attracts investment into this field. And, and I'd like to hear 
you know, what other ideas have been discussed and um, which ones do you think most likely to succeed in creating that incentive? Others? I'm Bob Guads, recently retired from the NIH, and I suppose my faculty appointment is the Collegium Medicum of the Agalonian University, and I'll give a nickel to anybody who knows where that is. Uh, it's 40 years, from the, essentially, from the publication of the concept of transmission blocking immunity, and now we have a pipeline, uh, just to show you how long these things take. But that's not my interest. I'm, I'm an entomologist. We don't know anything about the vectors in the Mekong. Uh, Mike mentioned Dyrus. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you would have said Dyrus is the vector all over the place. In most of Cambodia, it's inf almost impossible to find Dyrus now. It's a forest mosquito. The forests are gone. There are 26 potential vectors in Cambodia. And minimus may be the most important, but who knows? And who knows tomorrow? What we don't have amongst all these entomologists you talk about are biologists. Every entomologist now gets up and says, well, here is the molecular structure of such and such. But if that mosquito landed on their hand, they wouldn't know what it was. We need appropriately trained people. We have a question down here. My name is Wilson Magaya <clears throat> from Zimbabwe. Um, I heard something about uh, uh, materials that can be treated and uh, such small interventions. And I'm wondering why we do not have those on the ground. Uh, for example, I came across a blanket that was tested by a university in Africa, Africa University. And we tried to sell it as a private sector drive. And we were told we needed WHO approval. We needed to get uh, uh, certain paperwork. But uh, the chemical that was being used is already approved. It's EPA approved here in the US. And uh, the university had actually made a blanket infusing that chemical. Now, to interest the big funders here, we couldn't get any interest in it. The question then is, the discussion here seems to be happening here. We have researchers in Africa who are trying these small things. Is it possible to take maybe 5% or 1% of all R&D funds and put them into these small things that can actually be done now? and people try them out and say they work or not. Thank you, and I think there are some limited funds for that kind of um, concept testing, sort of the Grand Challenges Exploration Canada or Grand Challenges Exploration when there's a malaria topic from the Gates Foundation to test concepts. But clearly, just as uh, innovation comes from academia in the US and Europe, we also need to look for innovation coming from um, uh, academia in Africa and Asia. So I think that's, that's a really good point. Yes, Michael, you want to respond so if, to that? If I could just respond to that. About By the way, you need the microphone because otherwise people really Sorry. can't hear. So very good. You brought up the issue of the, the treated blanket. This is a permethrin microencapsulated blanket. And not to say that we're completely useless, but it has gone to the Vector Control Advisory Group for WHO. So it is under consideration by WHO now. And again, coming back to the issue of niche, we're thinking of this not for general population so much, but for um, South Sudan, for uh, CAR, for displaced populations outside the house. So again, coming back to what I said earlier, we may not have this one magic bullet, but it's these little niche products that I think will, in total, when you add them up, will make the difference. Um, having just two minutes left, I, I want to, to highlight um, this chair. <laughs> Um, how different the discussion is today than it was 14 years ago when I first became involved in, in, this, in this field. Um, there's a pipeline. 
there's a pretty robust pipeline of ideas and concepts. There are pools of money for development, not of all of them, but um, uh, for those that meet certain criteria. There's probably innovation money for testing of smaller concepts. Um, and I think compared to where we were in 2000, when none of the tools that are being used today were being used. We weren't using long-lasting bed nets. We weren't using insecticide-treated bed nets. We weren't using RDTs. The companies would call and said, we have them. No one will buy them. We weren't using ACTs. Remember, this is, this is before that horrible, art, painful article came out in The Lancet saying WHO is killing babies because there's no recommendation for this. These are innovations that now are old, but they weren't being used at that time. It doesn't take a lot of vision to look at the pipelines that have been described in this very humble, small session and realize that it is quite likely that the tools that we will be using 10 years from now will be quite different and will perform differently than those that we're using today. And so the challenge is really one for all of us because managing that kind of innovation influx is gonna test every single part of the system, but hopefully could make it much more effective and ultimately much more efficient. And I think that's the promise for the future. Great, thank you very much.